Hi, in this video, we're going to be, this series of videos, we're going to be working through a GCSE paper. Please do stop the video, have a go at each of the questions, then compare your solutions. Each of the videos is going to be about 20, 30 minutes or so. It should give you about an hour's worth of fairly focused revision. If you're not sure about anything, always add a comment. I'll come back to you and I'll look forward to seeing you inside the video. Hi, in this particular paper we're going to be looking at the November 2018 Maths Paper 3 and it's the foundation tier for Edexcel. So I'm going to aim for this video to be about 20-30 minutes or so, so we'll move on then to question number one. And it says write a number in each box to make the calculation correct. Well basically we're looking for the difference between 100 and 56.3. Now you might do it slightly differently to me but you should be getting an answer of 43.7 now it is actually a calculator paper so you can put these directly into a calculator it's the same with the next one what do we add to two sevens to make one whole well that's actually going to be five sevenths okay hopefully that's all right for you let's move on then to question number two which is writing three percent as a fraction well three percent basically means three out of 100 so I can write that as three out of 100 and that's exactly fine for this particular question Okay, question number three, so the square root of one, and just be very careful here, it's 0.44, just be very careful, so therefore it's going to be 1.2, and you can get that information directly from your calc. Okay, let's move on then to question number four, work out one-eighth of 720. Well, what we're going to do really, you can either take it from the calculator, or you can actually... Uh, do this kind of calculation. How many eights are there in 720? There's actually 90 of them, so the answer is going to be 90 for question number four. So we're moving along at a fairly good pace at this particular moment, but please don't hesitate to stop the video, have a go at each of the questions, then compare your solutions. If you're not sure, uh, put a message into the comments and I'll always get back to you. Okay, write down the name of this 3D shape. Well, it's actually going to be called a cuboid or some people would call it a rectangular prism and that's perfectly fine. Write down the number of edges. Now, just be very careful about this. The edges are going to be these sides here. So there's four at the top. There's actually four at the bottom, which is going to be eight. And then there's four around each side. So there's actually going to be 12 edges all together. Just be very careful about those sorts of questions. Sometimes it'll say edges, sometimes it might say vertices, which basically means these corners. Okay, let's move on then to question number six. So a fair dice is thrown once. The important thing here is a fair dice. So therefore the probability of it landing on any number is going to be equal. It's going to be one out of six because there's six numbers on a dice. Then it says on the probability scale below mark with a cross the probability the dice lands on an odd number. Well if we look at a dice we've got one, two, three, four, five, six numbers of which one, two, three of them are odd. So the probability of it landing on an odd number is going to be three out of six which is actually going to be this point right in the middle. Okay, write down the probability that the dice lands on a number greater than four. Now the important thing here is it's greater than four. It's not four and then more than four, it's just greater than four. So it's going to be number five or number six, which is going to be a probability of two out of six. If you want to, you could reduce that to one out of three. That's perfectly fine, but it didn't ask me to do that. So I'm just going to leave it as it is. OK, let's move on then to question number seven. Sean is 1.88 metres tall, which is actually the same as saying that he's 188 centimetres. Now, when I'm working through these things, I do tend to do this because I'm very aware, particularly these sorts of questions, that they tend to alter the units. We've got metres and centimetres there. So I'm going to change everything to centimetres. OK, and then it says David is 6 centimetres 
centimeters taller than Sean so it's going to be 188 plus 6 centimeters and that's going to be 194 so therefore David is 194 centimeters if you wanted to write 1.94 meters that would be perfectly fine as well okay let's move on then to question number eight this is a very standard type of question um, and really it's just a case of working fairly methodically through it so what we're saying right at the very beginning is that two pens cost that five folders cost that he wants to buy 20 pens okay so let's have a look just initially at pens well if he wants to buy 20 pens he's gonna have to buy 10 packs of pens and each pack costs £2.38. So if I multiply that through, I'm going to get £23.80, and that's going to be 20 pens altogether. Okay, hopefully you're okay with that. Okay, let's move on then to folders. Well, he got five folders in a pack, so he's actually going to have to buy four packs, and each pack is going to cost him £5.60. Multiply that by four, that's going to be a total of £22.40. Okay, and that's going to give him 20 folders. Okay, and when I add those two together, he's going to have £46 and 20p to spend. Okay, he's got £50. Does he have enough money yet? And you can usually write Ben has enough money. Okay, and that would be perfectly fine to get you the full uh, four marks on this particular question. Okay, let's move on then to question number nine. So the diagram shows five shapes and it says firstly write down the name of the shape E. Okay, well the name of the shape E, which is this one over here, is actually called a trapezium. Now it's slightly, it's sort of drawn upside down to the way we would normally see it, but that nevertheless is a trans. Uh, a trapezium. Okay, then it says two of the shapes are congruent. Okay, well congruent means that they are the same. Okay, so congruency is just a maths word that we use when we actually mean that something is the same. And then it says write down the letters of these two shapes. Okay, well if we go back to our diagram, it's actually shape C and shape D that are exactly the same as each other. One's just upside down to the other one, so it would be C and D, and that would be the answer to question number nine. Okay, hopefully you're doing well with these. Please do stop the video, have a go at each of these questions. Okay, let's move on then to question number 10. So on the grid, reflect the shaded shape in the mirror line. Well, you've got to imagine really that what we're doing is drawing a shape which is a reflection of the kind of L shape that we've got there. So the way we would do it is we would just draw something like this. Okay. Uh, that would be perfectly fine if you wanted to sort of cross hatch that just to show that you were meaning that shape. That would be perfectly fine as well. Okay, let's have a look then at number 11. There's men and women in a meeting. There's 28 women and 30% of the people are men. Write out the total number of people at the meeting. Well, what we're basically meaning is that if 30% of, of the people at the meeting are men, then it means that the women must be 70%. Okay, so the women must be 70% of the people at the, at the meeting. So therefore, let's just write that out. What we're saying is that 28 equals 70% of the people. Okay, right. So where do we go from there? Well, really, if we divide through by um, 7, then what we can do is we can work out 10% of the people okay so therefore 28 divided by 7 means 4 so therefore 4 must equal to 10% of the people at the meeting if I then multiply that by 10 again that's going to give me a hundred percent of the people which is the information that I'm I'm looking for okay so a hundred percent of the people is going to be 4 multiplied by 10 
which is going to be 40 and therefore at the meeting there must be 40 people okay I'll just put that back on the screen so you can see for yourself the working and the way that I've done that and the logic behind it okay hopefully that's all right for you please do stop the uh, stop the video have a go okay let's move on then to question number 12 uh, this is um, a very um, uh, popular questions so pie charts tend to come up quite a bit okay so Joan asked 60 people the name of their favorite vegetable okay and uh, this is the, the responses 24 of them like peas 16 like carrots and 20 like mushrooms so I just checked that that actually means 60 people now what we've got to be aware of is that in a pie chart there's actually going to be 360 degrees so what we're doing is we're representing those 60 people in 360 degrees so what I can do is I can say well actually 360 divided by 60 means that each person is going to equal 6 degrees so every person that's represented and made a response is going to be 6 degrees. So the actual angle is going to be equal to 144 degrees for peas. It's going to equal 96 degrees for carrots. And it's going to equal 120 degrees for mushrooms. And then if we add all of that up, just to check, that's 360 degrees in total. So it allows us to go ahead and draw our particular pie chart for the results. Now, um, I'm not going to put a protractor up on the screen. I don't think I've actually got one here. Okay, <laughs> But we can just draw, you know, um, a reasonably accurate. And obviously, if you measure it out to 144 degrees here, that would be peas. Okay, and then carrots is going to be just over 90 degrees. Degrees, so that's going to be 96 degrees would be carrots okay and then the one that's left we should be 120 degrees that's left okay that's going to equal to mushrooms okay hopefully that's all right for you if you're not sure let me know I do have some worksheets on pie charts that I can send over to you okay let's move on then to question number 13 so Annie sold 45 books at that price, 34 candles at that price, and then some calendars at 90p each. So just be very careful here because as I've mentioned before, they do like to chop and change the units. Okay, so 90p is actually the same as saying 0 0.90 in pounds. So I usually put a little note in there just to sort of remind myself and I think it's a good practice to do that. Okay, so how much did she get for her books? Well, she sold 45 of them at £1.20 each. So books is going to be equal to 45 multiplied by 1.20 and that's going to give her her total income for books is 54 pounds let's have a look at candles okay and we're going to do exactly the same process she sold 34 of them at one pound 50 so her candle income is going to be 51 pounds okay that means she's got a total of 105 pounds worth of income just from books and candles okay so what has she got left well she actually got a total of 150 pounds so therefore the difference between 150 and 105 is going to be 45 pounds so she got um, 150 minus 105 equals 45 pounds so therefore she must have got 45 pounds for calendars okay now what we're going to do is work out how many calendars Annie sold well each calendar she sold for in pounds 0 0.90 now remember that I'm trying to keep everything in pounds at the moment so therefore it's how many 90 P's or how many 0 0.9's are there in 45 so her total calendars must be 45 divided by 0 0.9 make sure you keep it in pounds and that should give you 50 so therefore she sold 50 calendars and that would be the answer to question number 13 okay so hopefully that's okay for you uh, please do let me know in the comments if you're not sure
OK, let's move on then to question number 14. So question number 14 is a probability question. Again, relatively popular. You've got a four-sided spinner. And now in this particular one, it's not... Um, completely it's what they call unbiased because there should be a quarter or one in four chance of landing on each of the numbers and there isn't okay uh, the chances of it landing on number three for instance is going to be 0 0.4 which is actually 40 percent so therefore it's what they call bias towards four okay now the point about all of these is that everything should add up to a certainty of one so the way we can work out the probability the spinner will land on a 2 is to add up all of the numbers we've got and take them away from 1. So therefore I can say, well, it should be, everything should be certain. It should be, land on a 1, a 2, a 3, or a 4. But it's 1, therefore, take away 0 0.2, take away 0 0.4, take away 0 0.1, and that's going to give us 0 0.3. Therefore, the probability of landing on a 2 must be 0 0.3. Three, and that would be the answer to part A. Okay, which number is the spinner least like uh, least, least likely to land on? Okay, so the spinner. The number that it's least likely to land on is going to be a number 4 because it's only going to land on a number 4, 0 0.1, which is, if you like, 10% of the time. OK, so I would say then that would be number 4. And then Jake is going to spin the spinner 60 times, work out an estimate for the number of times the spinner will land on a 1. Well, the probability of landing on 1 is going to be 0 0.2, so therefore it's going to be 60 multiplied by 0 point two and that's going to be 12 times for it to land on a number one okay i think we'll move through to question number 15 and we'll see how we get on with that for the time so number 15 bert has 100 cards um there's a whole number from 1 to 100 on each card. No cards are the same number. OK, so this is quite wordy. Bert puts a star on every card that has a multiple of 3 in it. He puts a circle on every card that has a multiple of 5 on it. How many cards have both a star and a silver? OK, so, okay, so just be very careful here because we're looking at both a star and a circle. Well, therefore, it must be because the star is on a multiple of three and a circle is on a multiple of five. It must be that when they have both a star and a circle, there must be multiples of 15. OK, so therefore, all we've got to do really is identify the multiples of 15 in the 100 cards. Well, 15 would be the first one. And then 30, 45, 60, 75, and 90. So the number of cards that have got both a star and a circle on them is going to be six cards. And that would be the answer to question number 15. OK, I think we'll leave it there if that's OK. And then in the next video, we're going to start through from question number 16 onwards. Uh, hopefully it's given you about an hour's worth of fairly focused revision. And I look forward to seeing you inside the next video.